Hello and welcome to everyone who's joined us for this interview, which is part of the Cambridge Judge Business School series, CGBS Perspectives, Leadership and Unprecedented Times. We sincerely appreciate you being with us today. Uh, my name is Paul Tracy. I'm Professor of Innovation and Organisation and Co-Director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation at Cambridge Judge Business School. Now, we're hugely honoured to be joined by Nobel Peace Prize Laureate Professor Mohamed Yunus, founder of Green Bank and Chairman of the Yunus Centre. Often referred to as Banker of the Poor, which is the title of his 2003 book, Professor Yunus was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his efforts through Green Bank to tackle poverty and inequality by providing microcredit to the poorest parts of rural Bangladesh. Now, global interest in Professor Yunus's work has culminated in the founding of the Yunus Centre, an organisation designed to disseminate the philosophy underpinning social business and to forge uh, lasting relationships between social businesses around the world. Welcome, Professor Yunus. Thank you very much indeed uh, for taking the time to join me in conversation today. And on behalf of the Cambridge Church Business School, we're absolutely delighted to be interviewing for you for this video series. Well, thank you, Paul, for inviting me for this uh, important uh, video series. I'm very happy to be with you and uh, delighted to have the conversation with you. Waiting for that. Thank you very much. So maybe just to get us started, if I could please ask you to uh, share a little bit uh, about your, your background and about what motivated you to want to find uh, new and different ways of, of, of tackling poverty and financial exclusion, and to, to then say a little bit about how that led on to the creation uh, of Grameen Bank. Well, I grew up just, just like any other young kids in Bangladesh. And I wanted to be a teacher. So I became a teacher after I did my master's degree. And then I got the PhD from uh, Vanderbilt University, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and started teaching in the USA. So I did that for a while. And then Bangladesh became an independent country, separating out from Pakistan. Uh, and then I resigned from my job right away. I said, no, I'm going back. I want to be back in uh, where I'm from. So I came back to Bangladesh and started uh, uh, teaching uh, in a university in Bangladesh, Chittagong University. And that's where everything began. Uh, and I was very frustrated uh, as I was teaching. And the country uh, ended up with a famine in the country in 1974. I came back in 1972 from the USA. And with all the excitement that I wanted to do good things and uh, wonderful things that I always wanted to do and wanted to be a good teacher. That's what I was always uh, prepared for. And that's what I was enjoying. But I didn't realize that uh, something will shocking will come, come over, uh, the famine, all the deaths around me and the hunger and deaths, uh, and then it raised a lot of questions in my mind. And I was frustrated with the subject that I teach, economics. I soon concluded that economics has nothing to do with people. This is just to make believe stories. And because uh, I don't see how what I teach in the classroom could be useful for the people that I see dying every day inching towards that because of hunger. So I kind of uh, withdrew from uh, what I was teaching and I thought I became a useless person. Uh, all this time that I spent in learning something made me totally useless, have no relevance to the life of the people. So going through that uh, frustration, I thought maybe I can find some use for myself uh, if I can go away from what I was prepared for teaching economics. I be with the people and luckily the university where I was teaching is surrounded by villages. Uh, and all I have to do is to cross the boundary of the campus and I'd be right there a thousand years old villages. So I started doing that every day. I will spend my time with the village and the people and so on. And the ambition in my mind was, can I make myself useful to even a single person each day, even a tiny little thing so that I can feel that I, as a human being, I'm still useful. To another human being. And that's what excited me. That's what I learned lots of things, lots of things I did around me. But something after a month, after a year, couple of years, I saw loan sharping that goes on in the village is terrible. It makes uh, victims of lost large number of people. And the loan size is $10, $15, $5, that's it. And they take over everything that the person has. And it's happening right in front of my eyes. I see both sides. I see the loan shark, I see the victims and they both uh, in the village. And I felt terrible that I can't do anything about it. And I looked at economics, economics never prepared me how to handle the loan sharks. So I don't know where to start. And I was worrying about it, I must do something. 
one simple idea came to my mind. Why don't I just go ahead and lend money myself? Now, my idea was, if I lend money, the person who needed the money will come to me and he will be protected from the loan shark because uh, he doesn't have to go to the loan shark. So I'm protect I protect I protect this one person. And I started doing that. I started telling people that if you need money, come to me, I'll lend the money. And I had some money in my pocket because I'm coming from the USA. I've been teaching there for several years. So I started doing that and money needed such a small amount. And it became very popular. That was the beginning of lending. I had no idea of lending anything. Just uh, lending came to protect people from the loan shark. Then as it became popular, I wanted to make sure that uh, it became more organized so that I can keep track of everybody. I brought my students to help me. So me and my students standing around doing this. And I picked up a big uh, debate with the bankers because I was attacking the bankers all along, saying that banking is totally designed wrong way. Banks are supposed to lend money but they do it in such a funny way. They lend money to people who already have lots of money mm -hmm. and they don't lend money to people who don't have money. Uh, I said, this is absolutely done in the wrong way. The real banking should be starting with the people who don't have money and gradually move up. Bankers laughed at me. They said, no, that's not how banking is. You, uh, you cannot lend money to the poor people. And I battled with that idea. Why can't we lend money? We are doing that. Uh, they said, they are not credit worthy. I said, uh, should you tell them that they are not credit worthy? Or should they tell you that you are not people worthy? Why don't you fix your organization so that you become people worthy? And we do it, it works for people completely. So that's how the whole thing about the fight with the bankers and the battling with the banking system began. And what it began in the middle of 1970s it still continues in 2021. That fight, that struggle has not completed, ended yet because it's, that is not accomplished yet. But how has the, the model evolved over these years since 1983 from when you started? How has micro lending microfinance changed? Not much. Uh, it's in, in the beginning, we changed lots of things as we grew up, as I was uh, trying to do something. That's when the, it took the real shape. And then finally, with the, after two years of our work, uh, we are doing the same thing repeatedly. So that's about basic things were standardized. And that continued ever since, that nothing has happened. And uh, when people keep asking me, how did you design this thing? Where the, why did you find those uh, um, meticulous uh, details of the working procedures and so on? I try to understand what the question is and I uh, try to answer in some way. But then I said, well, look, what I did I had, I had no background in banking. So I didn't know anything about banking. All I wanted to do help people with money and so on. And so that they can pay back easily. They didn't have any problem with paying back. So that's what my concentration is. Since I didn't know any banking, whenever I needed some procedure or some uh, uh, system, I just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. Once I learned how they do it, I just do the opposite. And over time, I did everything opposite. They go to the rich, I go to the poor. They go to the city center, I go to the rural village and the remote village. Uh, they go to men, I go to women. They make the principle that uh, people should come to the bank to do business. I reversed it. I said, no, people should not go to the bank. Banks should go to people. So entire the main bank that you have, the micro credit program that you have, is all about going to people, serving them at their doorstep, not let them come to you to do the business and so on. And conventional banks ask for collateral. Without collateral, conventional banking cannot be done. I said, forget about collateral. At that time, I didn't realize that what I was uh, throwing out. This is the fundamental of the entire banking. I threw it out, said, forget it. We do without collateral. And since we threw out collateral, we threw out all the bank, all the lawyers. So Grameen Bank became the only bank in the world which is lawyer free. Still is lawyer free and all the micro credit programs are lawyer free because you don't have collateral. So one after another, we threw out all the pieces. Then ultimately what we saw, we created the reverse image of banking. Everything in a reverse way. People say, hey, you started doing something which is putting banking system upside down. You put uh, uh, everything in a reverse way. I said, yes, I'm putting it upside down because banking system was standing on its head. So I'm trying to reverse it so that they can, it can stand on its feet. So this is what I did. Mm -hmm. So this is, I, I would say I've not changed over time. Only recent change has been making, has been made uh, because of the pandemic. 
Uh, and, and it came in a big way in, I mean, America. We work in the United States following the same principles that we have work in Bangladesh, addressing the poor people, all the women. We have over 140,000 women in the United States in the 15 large cities in the United States. We have 25 branches and we give loans without collateral to these women. Loans start under $500 and continue to grow. Today we lend out over uh, half a billion dollar a year and it keeps growing. But the pandemic shook us up because we cannot have a physical contact with borrowers and the bankers and all the things that we did in Bangladesh all along or all over the world. And then it started that way, I'd say exactly the same way we do in the villages of Bangladesh. We do the same thing in New York or Houston or Boston, wherever you work. But the, because of the pandemic, all the contacts uh, disappeared. So they came up with the virtual banking. So all the central meeting that we have is a virtual central meeting. They don't have to come uh, to a specific spot to have the meeting, which we did all the time. And all the transactions are done virtually. You don't have to bring money. You just over the phone, you transfer your money to your bank account and get the money from the bank to you and all that. Uh, and the bank staff don't have to go and visit them, talk to them or uh, talk about their future loans and so on. Everything is done in the virtual meetings and so on. So entire banking has become virtual banking. For so that's a big departure. Even after the pandemic is over, probably will not go back to the physical again because it works so well. And during the pandemic, we created our the 25th branch, which is in Chicago city. An entire bank was done, entire branch was done totally virtually, right from the beginning. We have not met physically any of our borrowers yet, but it's working. So now we are asking ourselves, why should we have physical branches, physical, people doing things uh, in a physical way. So this, this part will continue. I said, this is a major shift in that. Otherwise, essence of the banking, the procedures of the banking is still remain the same. So you, you mentioned <clears throat> um, that the empowerment of women is a really important part of the mission of, of Grameen. Uh, uh, you know, of your more than 9 million members, 90% of them are, are, are women. What led you to focus on the empowerment of women from the very beginning? And, and did you always think that the link between gender inequality and, and economic inequality was the core of what you were trying to do? Was that always the, the centerpiece of your, of your mission? No, this is not how, what it began. It's, it's all about uh, just interaction with the bankers and the fight that we picked up with the bankers. And one of the major part was the uh, fight was that you have uh, denied uh, financial services to the almost half the population of the entire world. That's not make, that doesn't make you a banking system for all people. So you are doing banking only for a fraction of the human population. So you deny access to poorer people. And then I said, you not only deny access to poor people, you also deny access of finance to women, any category, even she's the richest woman in the country, still you'll not lend money. You'll always ask her, have you discussed it with your husband? Why didn't you bring your husband along so that you can discuss? I said, always something different when you come to women. So I said, you are uh, not uh, friendly to women. So when I began, I wanted to make sure, and I pointed out very, very uh, sharply, I said, look, in Bangladesh today, at that time, meaning uh, today, uh, not even 1% of your borrowers, but the entire banking system, not even 1% of the borrowers happen to be women. Something drastically wrong in your system. Uh, so you cannot say that they're poor. We cannot be, I mean, talk about all women. Your, their husbands are doing business with you. They're not doing business with you too, either. So uh, when I began, I wanted to make sure half the borrowers in my program are women, just to make sure that same argument cannot be raised against me. Accusation cannot be raised against me. And it was a very tough job. Women said, no, 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 don't give it to me. Give it to my husband. I don't know anything about money. I never, I never handled money in my life. I never touched money in my life. Those are the kind of things that we used to hear. But we never gave up. We started, I started explaining to my girl students who were going to the women to speak on my behalf because I, as a man, I cannot go to them. Uh, they were, uh, my students were telling me that no, they are, really, they don't want to take the money. We shouldn't force on them. I said, no, I'm not forcing on anybody. I said, simply you remember when you go to a woman, you talk to her and she said, no, I never touch money. I never want to touch money anymore. I'm afraid of money. Uh, you give it to my husband. Always remember, this is not her voice. It is the voice of history which made her. So that is the most important part of what you're listening. 
I said, they are, ever since they're born, they're told uh, they did something terrible to the family because being a girl was a uh, negative things from happening to the family. So they're always looked at as something uh, said, accused of uh, being a woman. And so they try to leave as a non-existent person, non-visible person. I said, the money will make them visible. They you know, they get scared about that. So I said, what do you do? You go back to them again and again, peel off the fear which surrounds them, uh, all over them, uh, and take pe peel, peel the uh, uh, fears uh, layer by layer so that someday uh, the real person can, out, can, out, can, out, can come out of it to overcome all the fears that she has been surrounded with. Then maybe some of them may say, uh, maybe I should try. And that would be the beginning of our work. And to achieve that 50-50, we had to continuously work for six years to achieve that. It was such a slow process, but we never gave up. We always maintained that uh, insisting that we should be focusing on women. And finally, we made it. After we had made it, something else happened. We saw money going to the family through women, brought so much more benefit to the family than the same amount of money going to the family to men. So seeing this repeatedly, again, one after another, then we raise another question to ourselves. Why are we giving loans to men then, if it is so good, if you give the money to the women? So we changed our policy. We said, let's focus on women. And that's where our entire focus was on women ever since. And uh, we came up to 97%. And we said, well, leave some men. Otherwise, uh, we will not know what men does with the money. So we, in the Grameen Bank, we stopped at 97%. But when uh, Grameen ideas spread all over the world, uh, people, some of them continued as 100% women, like Grameen America, it's 100% women. They don't even bother about men. Uh, so it became thoroughly uh, as a financial service to uh, uh, very, very poor or low income women. So the social <clears throat> economic and, and cultural change is all intertwined really in the model, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. It's a most, most big contribution that Grameen did, not only the finance, it's also the bringing that other dimension, the women dimension of it. And as a result, I think all the things that happened to Bangladesh since we began in 1976 uh, is about the total transformation of the women in the country. Uh, the most dramatic thing that happened in Bangladesh in these years is the change of the status of women in Bangladesh. That transformed the entire country. So that's uh, so basic to the society. So is, is that what you see as the main legacy of, of uh, microfinance and Grameen? I would say it's the most, most important one, besides transforming the banking system itself, this is the core. But then uh, it, focusing on women, I would say the most important legacy of Grameen. That's great, thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now about some of the other ideas around um, uh, social business. So you've, you've written quite extensively, especially in, in uh, more recent years about the idea of social business. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the idea, um, what it is, how it perhaps it differs from related ideas uh, such as social enterprise. Yeah, idea is this, uh, I was saying that the whole banking system is designed the wrong way completely. That needs to be redesigned totally because uh, this is, this is a banking system which the core of the mission is the more you have, the more you get. So as a result, that became the uh, fundamental vehicle for creating wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world gets concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. And that is becoming something which will destroy the uh, human beings on this planet because it's a ticking time bomb. If you look at the uh, wealth uh, all the wealth is concentrated in few hands. Uh, if, if during the pandemic, everybody noticed, I'm sure it's very visible now, that the people who had the uh, $5.50 a day income, if you take that as a kind of a reference point, $5.50, uh, half the population of the entire world is below $5.50 income. So if you have an income map, you see half the population below that $5.50. Then you come to the $2.50, you have the poverty line. So under $2.50, you have all the poor people, 70%, 90%, whatever you see of the 50% that you have 
this goes into that. So 50% and then the uh, poverty line. But the pand- what pandemic has done, the push that the people who are in the below in the income map, push them down further. So those who are at the $5.50, they're below that line again because, because of the pandemic. They are under $5 or $4.50 or something like that. Those who are $2.50, they're pushed to $2. Those who are near 0.0 income, they're pushed to the zero income. So entire population is pressed there. So if you look at the $10 a day, $100 a day, uh, you'll see 90% of the entire population of the world. That's where it is. But if you look at the wealth, that's not where the wealth is, under $50, $100 a day. The wealth is somewhere way above. You go to far, far above that uh, income map, then you'll find the wealth. 99% of the wealth is up in the sky, not in the people. So you have 99% of the people down below in the income map. 99% of the wealth is up in the sky. And that di- distance between the people and the in- wealth is expanding every moment. And that's what the economic system is. That's what the financial system clears that machine to make the distance and so on. When we are talking about the pandemic, everybody knows that how many millions or even billions have been pushed down to poverty during this period, their income has lost and so on. So they lost their income and it came out in the income map. But in the meantime, same period, one year of pandemic, the people who are on the top, 99% owners of the wealth, they have added another $5 trillion to their income. So this is the difference. These people, 99% people lost their income. The 10, 1% people had another $5 trillion of income moving into them. So, and that means it again is moving up. I said the real economic machine, which used to be built, this is the wrong machine which we have built. The real machine should be to bring the wealth and people together and make them stay together. That should be the real uh, um, economic machine. So the machine now is totally designed wrong way. Financial system is responsible for it. We have to create a new financial system because the, that's where we bring the idea of microcredit and so on that it can be done. At the same time, we are saying during the pandemic, you saw all these people leaving the places where they used to work and told them these are all informal sector people. They are called informal sector. This is the terminology used by the economists, informal sector, meaning that you're not good enough to enter the formal sector, be just interesting for us to talk about. I said, no, they are interesting, interesting people by, to begin with. Simply, economists never had the guts to recognize it. These are not informal sector people. These are micro entrepreneur people. They take care of themselves because the society economy never takes care of themselves. They have their own ingenuity, their own creativity to make take care of themselves and they should be called micro entrepreneurial sector. But this micro entrepreneurial sector is left to themselves. They don't have any financing into it. Finance is the oxygen of entrepreneurship. If you do not provide that finance, entrepreneurship cannot work. So how do the micro entrepreneurs work? They go to the loan shark. That's the only place they can go. So the loan shark eat up all the benefits of the people who work and they remain as it is. People, who, the micro entrepreneurs remain where they are, that's where is it. Loan sharks move up, they become bankers and so on and so forth, moving up and businessmen and so on. Uh, and that's why every society is interested with loan sharks all around. And uh, you call them in, under different names, but they are the same people. But if you have the banking system organized for the uh, micro entrepreneurs, they will be moving up uh, very easily. So I said, we need to create a new banking system uh, or new banking law. You see, you referred to me as a banker to the poor. People talk, tell me that I'm banker to the poor. And Grameen Bank is referred to as a bank for the poor. I said, if Grameen Bank is a bank for the poor, what about the other banks? You should be calling them bank for the rich, but you simply call them banks because the people don't understand what you're talking about. So if Gamin Bank is recognized as a bank for the poor because we work for the poor, but the other bank is works for the rich. So you call them bank for the rich. Then you understand what is wrong with the system because you created a law which creates only bank for the rich. There is no law to create bank for the poor. Today, after so many years, so many awards, so many recognitions, so many celebrations of microcredit, microcredit still remains a footnote. After so 50 years from now, it's still a footnote. 
it does not uh, gain any recognition in a financial system because that system is built for the rich and that has no recognition for the financing for the poor. So I said, you need a new legislation, new law to create bank for the poor. And I insist that bank should be created as a, in, in the law as a social business microinterpreter bank. Because if you only give it a law to create bank for the poor, it will become the loan shark bank for the poor because of the overwhelming idea of banking to make money from the people will brought in. And since poor are helpless, poor are uh, uh, not organized. So the banks will suck up all the income of the poor people and become loan shark by themselves. So you have institutionalized the loan shark by creating the bank for the poor to make money for the rich. So that should not be it. So it should be def designed as a social business micro entrepreneur bank. What is a social business? Social business is a business to solve problems of people rather than make money for the owners. So it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. That's the social business all, all about. This is what we have been doing ever since we created Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank is a social business. We created many other social businesses along the way in Bangladesh. And that's what we have been promoting, that this is something that can be taught in classrooms. Today, classrooms don't touch that subject. So we continue to create businesses to make money. Maximization of profit is the goal of business, is what the goal of every young people to dream about. And so what's the, can you tell us a little bit more about what the Inner Center has been doing to promote the idea of uh, social business? Uh, people are interested to see the education system is only promoting the old ideas, old systems. Uh, so it only create new young people to go back to do the old things in the old way. Their minds are contaminated with the old ideas and continue to produce the same results. I said the academic institutions have been uh, uh, responsible for creating many wonderful things in the world, but they're also responsible for many dreadful things that happened to the world. And that some of the things that uh, they have done in their uh, classrooms is the global warming. Global warming is a product of things that we have taught our students to go out and do that. And that's what the global warming is. It's not created by God or any supernatural power. It's done by us because that's how we taught our young people to become and that's what they did. And also created the problem of wealth concentration by designing the uh, banking system. And we taught our students how to design a banking system. What is a bank? What is the objective of a bank? And they went out and do the same thing. So they created the same institutions that we have been creating and uh, producing ever since and continue to produce that and massive unemployment through artificial intelligence and so on. So. I said, we have to go back to the classroom so that we can undo all those old thinking. We create a new kind of thinking. In the old kind of economics, we are always told that the human beings are someone who are driven by self-interest. So you created at the core of your thinking, a human being who is, is fundamentally a selfish person, is driven by self-interest. That's why you created a business out of him uh, was a profit maximization because that's what is the self-interest is all about. I said, that's fundamentally wrong because human beings are not only driven by self-interest. Human beings are also driven by other interests. And I said, at least one more interest I can give. One is a self-interest and it is collective interest. Human beings are also interested in collective interest. Economics has driven away the whole idea of collective interest. It's pushed that away. We said this should belong to government and are the charitable organization. It doesn't belong to individual person. I said, no, it's very much individual person. So that's where the social business come. We, once we explore that the human being so, trying to solve uh, collective problem, then you need to create a business to solve collective problems. And that business is not, to, not created to make money for yourself as an owner. It's created to solve the problem. Uh, so this is a non-dividend company to solve human problems. So we teach this in the classrooms and uh, things that we should. Then the young people will come up that, yes, I have two options. I can either could do the profit maximizing business or work for them, or I can do social business and solve people's problem and global problem and so on. So these are the thought has to be done. So what we are doing since economics, has, uh, since the academic institutions are not doing it. So we thought uh, those people who are interested in our work will create some environment where they can have an opportunity to discuss this and learn from this. That's where the creation of UNICENTER came about. And UNICENTER helped 
various universities now to create what they call UNOS Social Business Center. Today, there are more than 90 uh, UNOS Social Business Centers around the world in 90 different universities where they give courses in social business and so on. Along with the social business, another fundamental change that we see and we promote that I say that all academic institutions create young people to become job seekers. Academic institutions take pride by saying that we, we create job ready young people. I said, that's a shame. Young people are not just robots you create and make them job ready and then fit into some slot in their business and so on. Uh, in company. Uh, you can, human beings are basically entrepreneurs. That's why they are born thousands of years back and continue to be there as, as an entrepreneur. They're not job seekers. They were never job seekers in their entire history. When we are in caves, we were not sending our job application from cave number five to cave number 10. Do you have a job for me? We went ahead. We, this is what our identity all along was. We are hunters and gatherers. We are problem solvers. That's where we are. But somehow economics came and said, no, no, you have to find a job. I said, job is the end of creativity of human being. A human being who is packed with unlimited creative capacity. That's what the identity of a human being. But job means you surrender your creativity and accept, uh, lead a life to lead with instructions, follow the rules. Don't think for yourself. Somebody will think for you and you follow the rules. And that is not what the human beings are about. So I said, universities, education and institutions should be preparing young people to become entrepreneurs, not job seekers. And that we have departed and we have to go back to the, our education system. Unless we go back to the education system, we cannot create alternative world. I said, we have to create an alternative world, which is not the way we are, which is finish. We are, put us in the disaster part. We are in a suicidal part right now with the global warming, with the wealth concentration, with the massive unemployment through artificial intelligence and so on. I said, we should be creating a new world. And I call this new world of three zeros, a world of three zeros, zero net carbon emission. We don't want any carbon emission. We don't want any global warming. We can create that by changing our own thinking process. That's all. We don't do things which creates global warming. That's as simple as that. But we create all kinds of things we said, reasoning and so on. Basic thing that we don't do things which would add to the global warming, that, that's the end of the story. And then uh, we want to create a world where there's no wealth concentration. In that world, wealth and people should be living together. They will overlap with each other rather than segregate. Wealth should be segregated from the people. That's, this current machine is a segregation machine. It segregates wealth from the people, squeeze out all the wealth from people and leaves it to few people on the top. And that's not the kind of society world we want to have. We want to get away from that world. And we want to create a world with 100% employment or entrepreneurship rather than uh, suffering to the harassment of seeking jobs and being pushed away from jobs by the artificial intelligence and so on. So that's the direction we should be uh, directing our education system so that the young people came, can come out and say, I can change the world. I don't have to wait for the government to change the world. I don't have to wait for anybody else to change the world. I alone can change the world and that capacity I have. And that's what the, they should be prepared for and taking steps by themselves and make sure they can do the thing that we said. I try to explain to young people, I say, look, we are in a spacecraft called planet Earth. And in this, uh, we are told to feel like some of them are first class passengers, some are business class passengers, some are economic class passengers, are waiting for their services, waiting for drinks, waiting for their meals. I said, that's not what the earth is all about. We are the navigators of this planet. We are not passengers on this planet, the way you are told that you are passengers. We are not passengers, we are the navigators. We decide where we want to take this planet. And we take it to the desired destination, not drifting into something. We know where we want to go. And each, each one of you as, as a young person, you have the responsibility to become the navigators and decide where you want to take this planet. Wherever you decide to take it, that's where the planet will go. So then is the responsibility, it'll be with the person individually to make sure that they do that. So this is where we try to bring up all these issues with the young people, 
to the universities, to the UNIS Center. Given some of the issues and the problems with the financial system that you talked about uh, earlier, to move to this alternative future that you talk about, do we need other types of systemic change? Do we need, what's, what about the role of government in making the types of changes that we need to see? Can um, young people through an education system really lead this by themselves? Uh, yes, uh, government has a role. Government has a role to uh, uh, champion all these ideas that yes, uh, we support this idea of creating a world of three zeros uh, and create the environment so that people can do that. Uh, government has the power to create environment for people to do the work. Uh, government doesn't have to do the work. Government has to create the environment. Like I mentioned the legislation part, only one. Create a legislation to create a bank for the poor, a social business bank for the poor. So that is the responsibility of the government and individuals cannot do that. If government had created the space and the legal space, then all these uh, social business micro entrepreneurial uh, banks will be coming up. Like uh, for example, we don't have uh, uh, social businesses in pharmaceutical companies. As a result, few pharmaceutical companies today uh, is controlling the vaccines of the world, controlling the lives of the world. And they are celebrating how much money they are making. Uh, although we have been uh, struggling, we have been uh, campaigning to make uh, these vaccines as uh, patent-free vaccines. Nobody should be owning this patent commercially because it's a, it's a, it's a question of life and death. Uh, you cannot make money in exchange of uh, deaths of people. So that's an unacceptable trading uh, issue, but they made it a trading issue. I uh, said so people, uh, millions and billions of people are drowning in pandemic, they're, they're dying all around the world, not in one country, all around the world. And few people, the few companies come with boats, said you can come into our boats, you can protect your life, stay alive, provided you come to our boat, but we'll allow you to come to our boat if you are the highest bidder. So they want to make the money out of the, your opportunity to, to give you opportunity to save your life and waiting to make money out of that. I said, that's a totally unacceptable uh, trading issue that uh, you uh, offer life in exchange of profit. So profit versus life is not something uh, a civilized world should be dealing with. But today we do, we're celebrating it. And all, three major companies will be declaring their dividend this week probably. Uh, the $26 billion uh, they have uh, earned as a profit this year by vaccines. So this is the kind of things that we are seeing. So there are vaccine people and there's a vaccine refused people. So we have vaccine apartheid in the whole world. And all the solution was to create a social business pharmaceutical company. If you had a social business pharmaceutical company, we don't have to worry about it because their intention is not to make money from people, is to protect their life. And that's what it should be. The, where the money coming from, people ask. Uh, who is going to invest in the thing? You know, all these companies would be making $26 billion uh, as a, a dividend. Bulk of their money came from the governments. $12 billion was given by US government to their US companies. And I'm sure billions of dollars were given the UK companies and billions of dollars were given by German companies, uh, by the German government, the German companies. I said, why do you give this money, public money to the profit-making companies? Why didn't you pull this money, create a social business uh, pharmaceutical company, which will be running as a company, this with your investment, but with the intention of uh, serving people to solve their problem, rather than make profit and uh, celebrate the dividend they're earning out of the life of the death of the people in the, in the world. So this is the idea I'm throwing. You have the money. Money is not a problem, but money is used in the wrong way. And we are talking about the CSR, how many CSR money you are receiving. You create foundations, huge foundations, uh, and given a charity. I said, charity is a wonderful thing, but the problem with charity is charity money can be used only once. Charity money goes out, does a wonderful work, but doesn't come back. What I'm offering you is a social business alternative. That money can go out, does a wonderful work and money comes back. And then you use it again and the money comes back again. So it's an unlimited use of the same money. That's what the social business is all about. You're not interested in profit. In foundation, you're not interested in making profit. So there's no conflict of profit here. 
It's a question of thinking process, how to create those. And social business pharmaceutical companies are not a very strange idea. It's a very simple thing. There will be lots of expert people who say, okay, I'll work for this company. Why should I work for the company which is making money out of the death of the people? I should be working for people, for the company which will be saving the life of the people. So that's the social business idea that we are trying to make up. And government has a role to create those opportunities. And government has a fundamental role to influence the education system that we should be producing entrepreneurs out of the young people, not job seekers. We are not, we are not born here to work for somebody else. We are uh, kind of a, uh, um, people to help you, help the big companies to make money uh, uh, by uh, working for you. Uh, so well, why should I work for you to make you money and then complain of the wealth concentration? If we all became entrepreneurs, there will not be any wealth concentration because nobody's working for you. So it's, a, it's, it's a something that the, instead of I'm being hired gun for you to pick up all the wealth for you and hand it over to you in, in exchange of a little salary that you give me, that's not what I want to do. I want to create my own business, uh, social business or otherwise, and be the pickers of the wealth myself rather than hand it over to you. If everybody is picking up their own wealth, then there will be no wealth concentration at all. And that is where the whole problem of uh, uh, education lies to make young people believe that they are entrepreneurs. Today, they, are, they cannot even believe that they're entrepreneurs. They say, oh, I have no idea how to become an entrepreneur. Then I give the example of my cohort. I said, look at all these millions of women in Bangladesh or elsewhere. In Bangladesh, more than 9 million women. In, in one bank, Grameen Bank, there are many microcredit programs today in Bangladesh. 9 million women, illiterate women, in the remote villages, taking $5 loan, $10 loan, $20 loan, becoming entrepreneurs. They didn't go to any business school. They became entrepreneurs. If illiterate women in a remote village can become entrepreneur with $10 loan, What's wrong with the young people going to Oxford and Cambridge and every, every other place? They have to go and submit themselves to work for somebody else because they said, oh, you know, I've been, not been trained for uh, being entrepreneurs. Simply that word is not on the table. Simply financial system was not created for that purpose. So that the financial system will be running after all the young people in education system. Then look, the moment you come with the business idea, we'll invest in your business. We are ready with your money. So then young people say, okay, I'm ready. I'm getting ready. You, you, the money is here. The moment money is here, everybody will be entrepreneurs. In Bangladesh, what we have done, we have created a social business venture capital fund. Social business venture capital fund. We tell the young people in Bangladesh, unemployed young people, don't wait around for job. Come with a business idea like your parents did, like your mothers did and borrowed from Grameen Bank. You come with a business idea and we invest in your business. We, provide, we become the provider of your profit, uh, equity. So we become a partner in your business. And all you have to do, make it successful, return the money that we give you. We don't want any profit out of your bank because you are a social, uh, out of your business, because we are a social business. We don't take anybody's profit. So keep the profit to yourself, make sure you return the money, and then we take the money and invest in somebody else's profit business. So now with thousands and thousands of young people coming with business ideas, we keep on investing in their businesses. They keep on returning the first round of money, then taking the second round of money, pay back the second, second round of money and take the third round of money, move on. Because it's nothing peculiar, nothing absurd. It's a just a genuine human instinct that human beings are creative, human beings are entrepreneurial. Given the opportunity, given the finance behind them, they all become entrepreneurs. Today, that finance is not available because we designed the financial system in absolutely wrong way. We only finance the person who already have lots of money so that nobody else can get a chance. Mm -hmm. So thinking about all these big businesses, these multinational corporations that you talked about before, um, what role do they have to play in the, in a future of business, a, a future of social business? Should we just give up on them or can they be... No converted or changed? No, we, we don't give up on anybody. See, our idea is we're not saying that rich people are bad people. We never said that. We said all people have these two instincts in them, self-interest and collective interest. But our teachers never told us that. So we never discovered that. So we are saying now, now that your teachers fail, we are now bringing that message that you have the other part of it. What they have done, if you look at the big rich people, they create foundations. See, everybody has big foundations and they pour in billions of dollars into the foundation. So you cannot blame them. And many of them today 
have signed a giving pledge. This was initiated by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, giving pledge. And more than 180 billion yesterday signed up that. The, the giving pledge is after my death, uh, all my property, all my uh, wealth will be handed over to charity or half of it will be handed over to charity. So they are not saying that, no, I will grab it. I'll never give it to anybody. They're not saying that. They're saying it's available. Simply our education, the fault in our thinking process made it happen this way. I have to wait for my life to do that. Some of them have done it already. They didn't wait for uh, dying uh, to hand over. Like Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg signed off all his wealth at the birth of his first child, the girl, girl child she, he had. He didn't give all his wealth to his newly born girl child. He deprived her. He gave away all his wealth to a charity, saying that hopefully this charity will make it a better world for the newborn child. See? So the, there are plenty of examples. It's not that they are crazy people, they want to stick to their money and so on. Simply we fail to give them the options which they can continue to do that. Imagine all this wealth of 180 top uh, billionaires. If the, all this wealth goes into social business someday, what will happen to the whole, whole world? Completely different world because we can solve all the problems of the world because finance is not a problem. Like we are talking about the, during the pandemic, we are talking about going back to the pre-pandemic economic situation. So we are picking up big amount of money as a stimulus packages. Every country has a stimulus packages all ready to go so that we can push the economy back to the pre-pandemic situation. And I keep saying that, why are you going to go back to the pre-pandemic situation? That was a terrible world. Pandemic has given us a chance to go away from somewhere else, not go back to the same thing. And that was terrible because of the global warming, because of wealth concentration, because of the massive unemployment which is waiting for us. We should not go back. So our decision today should be no going back. We don't want to go back. We want to create a new world. We go in a different direction. As in the train, the speed train, which is taking us to our death, death path, our uh, suicidal path. Today, that train has stopped because pandemic has stopped that. We can get off the train. Now that we can get off the train, we don't want to go back to the train again. We don't want to finish and get to the last station which is waiting for us. We go in a different direction. We build a new train to go a new direction. So this is where we should be doing. And people say, how do you do that? Where is the money? I said, well, we have all the stimulus package. Today, there are $16 trillion, $16 trillion put together in the stimulus package. Imagine the power of that $16 trillion. And instead of using this money to restart the fossil fuel industry, restart all the pollution creating industry, and instead of pushing this uh, plastic industry, we use this money to renewable energy. Said no fossil fuel anymore. We don't take fossil fuel to our new world. Fossil fuel is, remains under the grave, under the uh, soil. They never be taken out. We will be doing the renewable. So the renewable energy is a concrete thing. Money is available. Simply that money was designated for the wrong purpose. That's the point we are raising with the government. We're raising with the businesses. If you want to save it, this urgency of the situation is completely missed out. I said, we are now living in a burning house. Our house is burning, but inside the house, we are celebrating. We are having a big party, party of economic growth, success of the technology, success of the big businesses and so on. That's what it is. But the house is burning. We cannot recognize. I said, that's what the recognition has to come to the young people that we don't want to live in the burning house. We can stop the fire and create a completely new house for ourselves. That's what the role of the education, that's what the role of the uh, uh, government should be to make the savior so that people can do that. I, I keep repeating to the young people, nothing is impossible for human being. Only thing it needs to make a decision to do it. If a human being makes a decision and follow it up, it gets done. Nothing is impossible for it. And that's our history. So we should not say the world, what can I do? That's the world I have inherited. You have inherited that world, but you don't have to leave it as an inheritance for somebody else. You, in the meantime, you can change it completely. Our young people, our teenagers are marching on the street saying that our parents have given us, have stolen our future. The Fridays for Future people saying that. 
when the, your, your, say, your children are accusing you of stealing their future, something is terribly wrong in the whole system. The young people can see it, but the old people get blinded with the uh, glory of uh, partying and so on and so forth, ignoring the uh, burning house and so on. So we have to wake up. This uh, pandemic has given us a chance to wake up and take the new path to go to the new destination. Thank you very much. Do you have any uh, final thoughts, uh, Professor Yunus, for our global audience? I'm thinking in particular about uh, students who are uh, going to be graduating fairly soon uh, in this very difficult period. Have you any final thoughts about or advice about what they can do to help build this new future that you talk about? I, I would put it this way. I said the young people are very powerful people. That's what the future is because uh, the young generation today is the most powerful generation in the entire human history. Not because they are smarter than previous generation, just simply because they have enormous technology in their hand, which no other generation ever had in this planet. And that second generation that will come after this generation, they will be more powerful. And it, it will be this power of technology will go in a kind of a, uh, speed uh, unheard of. That's the speed it will grow. So what would be using this power for? You, I, I urge the young people to think for a while, are they familiar, are they aware that they are the most powerful generation in the human history? If they're aware, they have to ask themselves one question. What am I going to use this power for? I know I have the power, but I must know what to use the for. If I don't use this power, it will be to totally wasted. Power is not something you can keep in a battery and a store there. It, will have, it is not like that. Either use it today or it's done, finished. Is gone. So every moment I have to find out what use I'm making it for. And today, what use I'm going to do it today? Every day I have to make use of it. Otherwise, today's power is completely gone, finished. So this is an invitation that to make aware. And that, that fact that the human being can do things which were never done before, and they have to do it because young people are the one where their minds are still uncontaminated. Older people's mind got contaminated with the old ideas, old thinking, old way of doing things, old way of seeing things, because their eyes are done in a completely different way. They don't see the things that the young people can see. Then young people can have, will have to come up and take the charge of the steering wheel, that now we are running this well. And you say, well, everybody else uh, is not doing something. Why should we do it? You do it because this is the world that you have at your disposal. And you have to take it to the safety. Not only safety, safety is not enough. It's to make it a beautiful world. It's not only safe, safe world. It will be a beautiful world. The world that you created. You are the creator of the world. And you make sure you, you do that because you imagine that world. Imagination is uh, technology is power. Imagination is also a, another power. You imagine that world that you want to make, and if you imagine, it will happen. And if you don't imagine, it will, unfortunately, it will never happen because you never imagined it. So imagine it and go for it. You have the power to make it happen. Professor Yunus, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and for sharing uh, your stories, uh, for giving us your passion, for outlining your vision of what a, a different kind of future could look like. Um, we've learned, or I've certainly learned a huge amount uh, from listening to you, uh, and we greatly appreciate you uh, participating in this in this series, CGBS Perspectives, uh, Leadership and Unprecedented Times with the Cambridge Judge Business School. As always, uh, a big thank you as well to our alumni, to other members of the CGBS community who have joined us. Again, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you.